Hello everyone. So this is going to be a presentation which I am going to do right now on the recent advances in prosthesis, and I hope that I you I'll be able to take you through some of the slides as swiftly as possible and give you a brief idea about what to see and what to expect when you're looking at prosthesis while doing radiological imaging. By the way, to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Shayan from Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. I'm doing fellowship here. Before we start, what is a prosthesis? A prosthesis is basically uh, just defined as an artificial substitute or a replacement of a part of the body, such as a tooth, eye, a facial bone, a hip, knee, or another joint. It is basically an artificial extension that replaces a missing body part. So, what are the indications for a prosthesis? Now, a prosthesis can be used for three major indications. These are basically a bone tumor which can result in amputation resulting in the loss of the normal limb function of the patient, degenerative joint diseases which need a replacement by a prosthesis and peripheral vascular diseases which again result in loss of limb function necessitating the use of a prosthesis. So first of all what is the imaging that we do for malignant bone tumors while utilizing prosthesis? So staging Malignant bone tumor, primary bone tumors requires both intra and extramedullary involvement evaluation. So intramedullary extension includes an assessment of the longitudinal extent, the epifacial involvement as well as the skip metastasis. Extramedullary extension basically provides an assessment of the muscle compartments and the joint feasibility, which helps in the movement of the joint. When a bone tumor is encountered in a skeletally immature child, we have to evaluate the growth plate and epiphyseus as well. Indeed, fascial sparing may be significant to the very young in whom growth is essential. Joint involvement requires extra-articular resection, therefore it is essential to, find, to assess the presence of intra-articular masses or focal replacement of intrasynovial fat. Finally, a pathological fracture is taken to confirm the joint contamination as it is equivalent to extra compartmental extension. So these are the things that we should keep in mind or we should evaluate while we are looking at a bone tumor initially. So just to give a startup, this is an aving sarcoma uh, in a 10 year old boy where the fast spinico inversion recovery sequence shows the medullary extent of the lesion. And as we can see in the coronal image owing to the contrast between the growth plate and the tumor, we can see that there is some facial involvement. So facial involvement should always be accurately assessed since it influences the surgical strategy. Another example of skewed lesion is medullary hyperplasia. This is a T1 weighted image where we can see there is a black arrow which is recognizable distal to the tumor and as a result of the signal alteration which is causing medullary hyperplasia. The low signal is pronounced and it has got a blurred margin. So now coming to the main part that is what are the components of a prosthesis. Prosthesis has some basic components. These basically include a socket which is basically a plastic receptacle where the residual limb is contained, an appendage which may be a hand or a foot depending on whether it is the upper limb or the lower limb, a joint which is basically the connection between the appendage and the main proximal part of the limb. It can be the wrist joint, the elbow joint, the shoulder joint or the ankle joint or the knee or the hip for that matter and a connecting module that connects the appendage and the joint to the socket. So what is a shank? A shank is basically a substitute for the human leg. It helps in restoring the length and shape and is located above the foot ankle assembly. It can be below the socket in case of trans tibial prosthesis and there are two types of shanks. One is the exoskeleton shank, other is the endoskeleton shank. Now coming to the types of prosthesis. First of all, we can have an endoprosthesis. So as we can see in this image, there are two prostheses which we can see. One is for the humerus, that is the upper limb, and there is one the femur, that is the lower limb. Both are endoskeletal prostheses where we can see the receptacle is placed within the residual part of the bone, while the rest of it has been amputated, and there is an articulation which is present with the joint, where we can see the fixators placed within the joint cavity. Self-expanding prosthesis. Self-expanding processes basically works on the principle of expansion on its own and it is one of the most common types of processes that is used which helps in proper functioning of the limb even after the amputation or the removal of the original limb has taken place. So what are the uses of the socket? 
the socket helps in maximum distribution of the load it helps in venous blood circulation and it also provides a tactile feedback now tactile feedback is important since that will help in the individual to properly assess the position of the artificial limb and change himself or modulate his actions accordingly and it has also got some reliefs and build ups patellar tendon bearing socket has a prominent indentation over the patellar tendon so these are some images that i have collected to give an idea about how these components look as we can see there is a hard socket there is a hard socket with a pelite liner now patellar tendon bearing socket as we can see it is impending on the patellar tendon as mentioned earlier it is used for the lower limb basically for the knee joint and patellar tendon bearing socket can be supracondylar as well as suprapatellar in nature now this is for the elbow as we can see above elbow prosthesis then we have the above knee prosthesis as well as the below the knee prosthesis these images may help in understanding how the hardware is basically where we can see flexible inner liner socket a laminated frame and the bionic knee in the case of the above the knee prosthesis there is a microprocessor as we can see in the image which helps in sensing the movement and gives the necessary tactile feedback to the individual also we can see there is a shock absorber which is used for below the knee prosthesis so this is again just a depiction of the components of the prosthesis this is basically a mallory based prosthesis where we can see an acetabulum as well as the femoral stem there is an acetabular liner which is placed within the acetabular cup it helps in proper articulation between the main femoral stem and the acetabulum and helps in proper movement to take place at the joint that is the hip joint for this case now the acetabular liner can be made up of various components it can be a cemented type or a cementless type and it can also involve the cementless type of the femoral prosthesis articulated in a cemented type of the acetabular cup and all these have got various nuances and complications attached to each of them i'm not going to discuss them in lot of details because that may be too much uh, to cover within this span of time but still this gives us a broad idea about what are the basic components which we will see if we can dissect the prosthesis and make out the individual hardware this is the imaging depiction of the mallory based prosthesis as we can see which has been placed in the right hip joint in this patient as we can see that there is an acetabular cup along with the part of the femoral stem and there is a lining which is pleasant inner side so one is cemented and the other is non cemented so these are the groin zones which we have to keep which we have to look at probably when we are evaluating a limb after the placement of the prosthesis so we have to keep in mind that there are some complications that can occur after the placement of the prosthesis one of which is basically loosening we can divide the joint into these three quadrants as we can see in the image on the left hand side of the screen where the uh, anything in the zone 1 is uh, considered to be normal but in zones 2 and 3 if there is any kind of loosening or any kind of loosency that is seen between the prosthesis and the main limb then it is considered to be pathological again there is another type of division where we can see that there are even seven zones based on the femoral shaft again something in the region 1 is normal and the other parts is not considered to be normal this is a depiction of the elbow prosthesis where we can see there is a a prosthesis which has passed through the ulna shaft and into the lower end of the humerus where we can see the articulation taking place at the elbow joint and this mode of prosthesis is used for considering the fixation of the elbow and helps in proper movement as well as mobility of the elbow joint after the patient has undergone a procedure or a prosthetic placement for some reason this is a prosthetic cap which is used for the medial femorotibial joint where we can see the articular surfaces have been covered of both the medial condyle of the femur as well as the tibial plateau which helps in preventing friction or contact between the articular surfaces with each other and as we can see on the image on the other image on the left hand side there is a reduction of joint space that has taken place in this individual probably due to some underlying joint disease or degenerative condition and this prosthesis will help reduce the damage that will be caused to the articular surfaces and helps in better preservation of the joint functions again coming to the hardware component so this is the metal tibial component as we can see the patellar component the polyethylene which is placed inside the metal tibial component and acts as a liner uh, 
metal condylar component which is placed in the femur and all these components together make up what is called the process now this much of hardware may be not necessary for a radiologist point of view because we won't be looking at the hardware what we will do is mainly go into the imaging part and see that how these processes can be evaluated or how that can help in our interpretation of the images when a patient presents with a prosthesis and we have to image that patient so as we can see in this image there is a shoulder prosthesis in this individual where there is a shaft going into the humerus and there is an articulation artificial artery taking place with the glenoid cavity on the right side again below the ankle prosthesis where we can see the talar dome as well as the lower end of the tibia being covered with articular caps same the ankle prosthesis which i just showed on the x-ray the components there is a tibia plate there is a talar component there are some mobile bearing which are present between the two components and these bearings help in the smooth functioning of the striker at the ankle prosthesis and helps in the movement of the ankle joint now coming to the one of the most important parts of this presentation so what are the complications that we need to be careful about when we are dealing with a patient who has undergone a prosthesis so there are some uh, certain complications the most common is metallosis particle disease infection loosening tendon injury and muscle injury so this is an example of a metallosis where we can see that there is a lobulated t2 hypo intense uh, lesion or a structure which is seen adjacent to the joint and we can see that there are some hypo intense components which are also seen lining the lobulated cavity so this is typical example of metallosis which is basically seen in, in certain cases of prosthesis especially with cobalt chromium alloy usage in the prosthesis it is a uh, basically a hapten mediated hypersensitivity reaction which is adjacent to the joint and can be seen in the case of a prosthesis especially if the metal alloys used are cobalt and chromium we need to be on the lookout for this and need to identify this we need to differentiate it from the other possibilities like maybe infectious causes or other more sinister complications that can occur so the typical feature is the t2 hypo intensity which we can see and it is like a globular in shape and this probably gives us a good idea that this can be considered metallosis which is an aseptic condition and need not be confused with infection particle disease now particle disease is a synovial inflammatory reaction which basically occurs secondary to the process displacement unlike the previous example which was uh, basically a, a hapten mediated hypersensitivity reaction particle disease is not like that particle disease is basically when after placement of the prosthesis there are certain destructive processes that can come into play and that results in the formation of a fluid like t2 hyper intense lesion which we can see adjacent to the joint as we can see so the main differentiation which we can probably do is based on the signal intensity as we saw in the last case a metallosis is t2 hypo intense whereas a particle disease will result in the formation of a t2 hyper intense lesion both these conditions are related to particular to the use of metal prosthesis and are peculiar to those uh, peculiar to them this has got no such uh, co correlation with cobalt chromium alloy usage as we saw in the last case so this is separate from that and this also needs to be kept in mind when we are dealing with the prosthesis loosening is basically a lucency or a demarcation that appears between the parent limb or the residual limb and a prosthesis it can be seen as a hyper intense linear demarcation in if you are using mri for t2 weighted image or for that matter fat suppressed sequences if you are using an x ray we will see it as a lucent lining which will cross 2 to 3 mm in width and that should always indicate that there is a possibility of loosening taking place and we have to make sure that we inform the findings to the orthopedician in case the loosening results in the dislodgement or the process is not properly lodged within the joint and it cannot serve its proper function infection is obviously what we know that infection can happen so the key is not to confuse the other complications with infection infection will have subcutaneous edema as we can see on the stir sequences it will have uh, joint diffusion as we can make out and Uh, like i told earlier the signal intensity of the subcutaneous tissue and the joint effusion 
along with the marrow edema or the edema in the surrounding bones will probably point towards the possibility of an infection rather than the other complications that have been discussed earlier infection obviously needs an urgent action we have to inform the clinician and suggest proper antibiotic usage to prevent it from going further and further complicating the scenario so basically this is just a gross flow chart that can be used so history of pain discomfort then we can go for serology, ESR, C-reactive protein, total white blood cell count and a radiograph. Normal criteria of infection, low probability of infection. So first we have to see if there is any raised major criteria of infection. If there is a major criteria of infection, the further imaging should be done in the form of bone scan, CT scan or if necessary a biopsy for that matter. If there is a low probability of infection, we have to go for the component position. If it is satisfactory, then we have to think of radiographic osteolysis. If there is no osteolysis seen on the normal X-rays, then we have to go for a CT MRI, metal iron measurement if necessary. Now, if there is loosening or osteolysis, then further imaging needs to be needed using MARS protocol, MRI, CT or SPEC CT. And finally, we have to diagnose the presence of osteolysis, inform the clinician whether the implant is stable or unstable. Now, that is the key. If it is stable, then we can follow it up. If it is unstable, probably needs some inter intervention on the part of the clinician. So quickly going through the drawbacks. So there are some drawbacks which we come across when imaging metal processes. One is the metallic artifact production. So the metallic process, magnetic process not suitable for MRI because the MRI can cause heating of the implants, which can cause tissue damage and also it can cause migration of the implants. This is an example of streak artifacts that have been that have resulted from the usage of bilateral hip processes in this patient as we can see the image is very poor and we cannot discern anything within the pelvis for that matter again artifacts resulting from the use of processes when the mri there is a lot of uh, hypo intense uh, metal artifact production as we can see in this image as a result the joint cannot be visualized properly and because of this artifact the evaluation will not be properly done so there, this is just a gross protocol which we can use where we can use the fast pin echo T1 and T2 image. So the types of metal artifacts that we should be kept in mind, in-plane distortion and signal loss, poor or absent fat suppression, geometric distortion and through section distortion. Now what are the remedies? Quickly, some few points to keep in mind. High bandwidth can help in reducing the artifacts as well as swapping the frequency encoding and the phase encoding directions. We can use Pinico or Fast Pinico instead of GRE because that also reduces the artifacts. Use STIR instead of spectral fat suppression because spectral fat suppression will not be properly applicable if we are using metallic processes since that can result in lack of homogeneity and thin sections are also help in this matter. There are some special sequences like Mars, Maverick, CMAC. Probably I'll just go through them briefly. This is a VAT view angle technique where we can see the readout direction is altered so that the view angle tilting helps in reducing the artifacts from the metallic processes. Mars protocol, just a overall tabular representation of which are the sequences and what are the various timings. CMAC is slice encoding metal artifact reduction technique which is another technique used by the different vendors which helps in reducing artifacts and we can understand how the frequency encoding direction is changed and it helps in altering the readout gradient so that the artifacts are reduced. Maverick, another technique similar to that which also helps in reducing the artifacts in the frequency encoding direction by providing repeated excitations and then reading them out in a swift fashion so that the artifacts in the final image are reduced. Now, common metal suppression sequences according to the various uh, vendors are Mars, which is the most commonly used clinical man warp, which is used by Siemens, CMAC again used by Siemens and Maverick, which is used by GE. So these are the basic techniques they use. I'm um, given them in tabular form and high bandwidth is used by warp. CMAC uses backfolding of the off resonance signal and Maverick uses petally non-selective excitation. Now the complications lastly. To round it off, it can be metal suppression can have certain complications like specific absorption rate and increased imaging time. Specific absorption rate will probably increase the heat quotient and increased imaging time will increase the duration of the study. So this is just a quick idea of how useful these sequences are. As we can see, there is the image in the middle is poorly discernible because of the artifacts of the metal used in the lower end of the femur. However, 
after using of the mars technique it we can see that the margins of the femur are better visualized because the metal artifact reduction has taken place another example with metal artifact reduction technique where the right shoulder in the first image is not that clearly seen but in the second image is much better seen because we have used metal artifact reduction techniques similar application can be done in case of vertebral imaging also where the spill encoding and corresponding maverick sequences show significant reduction in the metal artifact reduction and also helps in interpretation whether there is any disc herniation or not in this particular patient in a sacroiliac joint also similarly we can use where there is a screw fixation has been done and following that we have imaged with the help of maverick to see for better depiction of the adjacent end of the cord and also to visualize whether there is any complications taking place at that particular joint so these are my basic references hope i was able to give you some kind of an idea about processes thank you so much for watching that's it for now